Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever you are, and welcome to another sneer, uh, bright talk presentation uh, from the Networking Storage Forum. And today's presentation, uh, just in case you're uh, in the wrong one, you can always leave now. If you're in the right one, if it says, not again, data deduplication for storage systems, I'll, I'll repeat that. Not again, data duplication for storage systems. There's actually a joke in there. And we'll get to another one at the very back end of the presentation. Uh, and to be quite honest, you can't stop me. So hey, you're just going to have to wait till the end to hear it. So without further ado, let me uh, uh, introduce you to some of the features of our Bright Talk here. First of all, uh, you'll notice that the screen is relatively small. If you want to make it bigger, you can actually present this entire uh, window and full screen on your monitor. And that, for some of the slides, depending on the uh, detail, you might find helpful if you're uh, not being able to see any of the detail on the slides. I don't think we've got many like that today, but if you need to, you can always make the window much larger. You also have the ability to ask us questions, so please do so. Put your questions in the question box. And if we have time and if we are able to, we will answer the question during this presentation. Otherwise, we will Answer the, uh, answer the question and put the, the uh, answers up on our blog, and you, I'll give you the address of the blog as we end this session today. Um, secondly, there's an attachments and links you can go to. You can get the presentation in PDF format uh, from that link, and uh, you should be able to uh, see the slides as we move along. And thirdly, feedback. If, when you leave today, if you could score our presentation from one to five, five is, love it, more please, is exactly the sort of thing I want, and one is, I'd rather be playing golf, even though it is November here and it's a little bit wet and golf isn't exactly the kind of thing you might want to do in a dark evening like tonight where I am. So, let me introduce the speakers. I'm Alex McDonald, I'm the moderator for today, and I'm the vice chair of the SNEER Networking Story Forum. And today, I'm joined by Abhishek Rajamwale, who is a distinguished member of technical staff at Dell. Abhishek, good afternoon. Is it afternoon for you, or is it just still morning? Alex, good morning. This is good morning in California. Ah, it's a morning in California. And we're also joined today by John Kim, who is the chair of the SNEER Networking Story Forum uh, from NVIDIA. Uh, Good morning, John. It's morning. Yes, it's morning where you are too, isn't it? Yes, I'm also in California, Alex. Thank you. And a good morning, or well, good evening to you. Good morning for me and Abhishek. Yeah, good evening from me. So I'm in a, in a dark and cold uh, Scotland this evening. So uh, SNEA, what is SNEA about? The Storage Networking Industry Association is an industry-leading organization with about 185 companies who contribute to the advancement of uh, storage, network storage in particular. We've got about 2,000 active contributing members from a wide variety of companies, and we also have about 50,000 uh, IT end users and storage pros, of whom you are some, and welcome today to our presentation. You can learn more about the technical work that SNEA does at sneer.org slash technical, and you can follow us on Twitter at at SNEA. What does the Networking Storage Forum do? Well, in particular, we focus in on things that are networking in terms of storage. So Ethernet, iSCSI, NVMe over fabrics, and various other technologies uh, such as fiber channel. We also take an interest in storage protocols that run over those um, uh, connectivity, the, the network connectivity. So we're interested in block and file and object protocols. And we also take a great interest in basically anything that allows us to talk about the benefits of modern storage systems. And today, we're going to be taking a crack at that when we talk further about uh, deduplication. So just a quick legal notice. Um, you can read this as well as I can. None of us is lawyers. Um, but the one thing I would encourage you to do, first of all, is to honor our copyright. And secondly, to recognize that if anything you decide to do based on this presentation, breaks into two pieces. Both those pieces are yours. So what's today's agenda? Today's agenda, we're going to talk a little about deduplication basics, and I'm going to hand over to John Kim shortly to talk a little about the, uh, the basics of deduplication, uh, the, thing that, you know, the things we might think about 
uh, in terms of what it is that we're putting on our storage and how we can be space efficient with it. And then Abhishek is going to talk to us about the concepts and considerations of deduplication and show us deduplication in action, how deduplication actually works. And we will then wrap up and discuss other presentations we have in this series that cover deduplication, compression, and other uh, topics. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to John. John, take it away with the deduplication basics. Thank you very much, Alex. So let me cover some of the basics of deduplication, uh, why we use it, where we use it, and then Abhishek will get into the technical details of different ways to do deduplication and the pros and cons of those different ways and uh, some of the, again, some of the more technical details. So first, why is data so often deduplicated? I've got a picture of clones here, but let's pretend they're just duplicates or cloned robots. So I think one of the number one reasons is email attachments. So I email something to 10 people, they each have a copy of it, and then some of them forward it, some of them save it locally, uh, and every time it gets forwarded, the attachments, the email and the attachments, the attachments are usually much bigger, get copied again and again and again. Uh, and then there's always the user's copy of local data. So I put some interesting, useful information or files on a share or on a NAS appliance, and then the users look at it and say, that's important, and they make local copies to their uh, laptops, their desktops, or their own network shares. So the same content then lives in the original share plus a bunch of home directories or local drives. Test and development projects mean that you have the master copy of the live data, but many, many different teams are making partial copies, either in full copies or partial copies of that data, so they can do analysis, they can run a test program, they can write new software and test it against that data or develop it against that data. So uh, you often find that the, there's the live data and then there's 30 or 40 you know, partial or full copies of the live data being used for different projects. And finally, backups and mirroring are a huge source of duplication because usually the same content is backed up again and again and again. Many backup solutions make a full backup once a week, and then they do differential backups in between. So differential, of course, only backs up the new or changed content, but every week and every month they're still making a full backup or full copy of everything, whether it was backed up before or not. The result is hundreds of exact duplicates of files and possibly thousands, hundreds or thousands of copies of files or objects which may not be exactly the same, but are nearly the same. You may have many f copies of files that are 99% identical to each other with only tiny differences. So enter deduplication. The basic idea is that when I want to deduplicate data, I look at data, I, save the fir I see a piece of data or a chunk or a block or a file, and I save, the save it the first time I see it. And then if I see it again, I don't save it again. I find repeated patterns, either inside a file or repeated files, and then I, uh, after the first time, instead of saving it or transmitting it again, I just save or transmit a pointer, which points back to the first copy of that. And so if the same data appears 10 times, I only have to save one copy of it plus nine pointers. And uh, the nine pointers are each, of course, usually very small, much smaller than the actual file. And again, if I, and actually if I need to undedupe or rehydrate the data or read the data back, uh, in many cases, uh, I may be able to save time by reading back the original file once, or original block once or chunk, and then reading the pointers. And as I read the pointers, I just point back and read the same original file or chunk of data again. So that's the very basics. Abhishek will go into much more detail. Why would I deduplicate data? Well, there are several benefits. Of course, the biggest benefit, the one most people are looking for, is to save space. Save space on the storage, whether it's local storage, network storage, or backup storage. And they also want to save bandwidth. So if the data is being transmitted over a WAN link or being sent to a backup destination, deduplication can result in a large savings. Because again, instead of transmitting the same file or same block or chunks of data repeatedly, you just transmit it once for each time you find a new block or something you haven't seen before, you transmit it once across the network. And then every time you see it again, you can just transmit a reference or pointer to the first copy instead of transmitting the data again. So tremendous bandwidth savings. Uh, and that also can be a big time savings for backups. 
simply because with backups, they're often going over uh, a network, sometimes a long distance network, and reducing the amount of data sent means the backup can happen much faster. And deduplication can also reduce the wear on flash in some cases. So as you know, with flash, uh, reading does, is uh, harmless, but writing or changing data does slowly wear out the flash. So deduplication can reduce how much data you have to write because, again, you're typically writing just point, small pointers instead of writing the same files again. What does not uh, is not benefited, or what? Sorry, what does not benefit from deduplication on primary storage? It usually does not improve performance. In fact, it might slow down performance depending how it's done. And again, Abhishek will get into more detail about when you can do deduplication. And it generally does not improve security uh, other than in the perhaps uh, indirect way that reducing the amount of data you're storing may make it easier to secure it. But deduplication is primarily for space savings, bandwidth savings, and uh, time savings on backups, not for improving performance or improving security. There is often a question we get at SNEA is that should I deduplicate or should I compress or should I do both? Uh, and the actual answer, as I'll get to in the next slide, is most storage systems can and do both uh, processes for data efficiency. But the difference is that both techniques are actually looking for repeated data and then replacing that data with symbols or shortcuts or links uh, in some way. But they work a little bit differently other than that. Deduplication usually works on files or objects uh, on the primary storage or the local storage level, though it can it often works on blocks uh, when you do backup. Deduplication tends to be more broad, a wider scope, meaning that it looks, uh, looks at a wider area when it's finding duplicates or deciding how to save space. It may look at an entire file system uh, or entire storage system or one whole drive. Uh, in addition, with backup, it may actually look globally. Uh, or with object storage, you may look across the whole network or whole enterprise or whole multiple data centers, in fact, for deduplicating backups. And it's more coarse grained. Usually deduplication will look at a block or file, but doesn't look inside the block, or in some cases does not look inside the file to see if there's any duplicate data inside there. It just says, I've got two identical files, I'll save one copy, or 10 files, I'll save one copy, instead of two or 10 copies of that file. Uh, and sometimes it works at the block level. Compression can often look at a much finer grain. It can sometimes look at the individual blocks or even inside blocks of data. Uh, and, by, and by the way, that could be blocks of data logically or blocks uh, on the storage, depending on where you do that compression. Compression usually works on individual files or individual objects or individual storage devices like a hard drive or an SSD. So where deduplication might look across uh, a store a file system and look for copies of files, compression probably tends to look at each file individually and say, can I compress this particular file or this small section of the drive? So it operates more locally than deduplication. It usually has a narrower scope. All right, let's go on. Uh, and so in fact, you can use them together. And uh, oh, sorry, that is the next slide. So first, who, what, or where can I do deduplication? And Abhishek will cover more about when I should or can do it. So you can do it at the application level. This is not common, but uh, except in email and backup applications. Email applications often save only one copy of an attachment and reference it when it knows that many people have saved or, or attached the attachment to many different emails. Uh, and then uh, it is more common for some applications like some databases to do compression instead of deduplication. A local file system can also do deduplication, but again, this is really rare as far as I know today. It's much more common for file systems to offer compression as an option uh, than deduplication. Network devices, so regular NICs and switches and adapters usually don't, don't do anything like this, except that uh, those who do WAN optimization often do block deduplication. Uh, and there are some uh, what we call uh, DPUs of data processing units or smart NICs that offer some deduplication capabilities, but those are usually uh, actually for deduplicating the local storage, not for deduplicating content on the network. The storage devices, meaning an individual drive, today this is not common, but with the advent of computational storage, I expect we will soon see uh, SSDs or smart SSDs that are able to do compression or deduplication or both on their own on the device. 
Now we get to storage systems. Here, deduplication is very common. Most of the advanced uh, enter or most of the enterprise storage systems do support deduplication today, and many also support compression at the same time. And in backup systems, this is also very common. Many backup systems, either software or appliances, uh, offer deduplication simply because it's kind of expected in the world of backup. Uh, and there's some of them do deduplication globally, and then once they get the data to the drive or SSD or tape, they do local compression after the deduplication. And that brings me to, can I use them together? And as I mentioned, you can use them both. Uh, it turns out that it's not always a clear choice whether you should do, which one you should do first. So some storage systems do compression, then deduplication, and others do it the other way around, deduplication, then compression. Uh, and there are advantages to both orders. Uh, for example, if you are doing global deduplication, then compression, doing compression first can be a problem because using slightly different compression windows or technologies at different locations would mean that the same data, when it shows up at the central storage or central backup device, uh, now looks different because it was compressed in a with a different window or different technique. So if you're doing global dedupe, you'd probably want to dedupe and then compress. On the other hand, there are other cases where on a local system, it may make sense if you know you can consistently do compression, the same compression for every identical file, it may make sense to compress and then dedupe. One key message is that if you add encryption, any strong or mo good modern encryption will break deduplication and break compression because the same file encrypted will come out differently if you encrypt it first. So almost always if you're using encryption, pretty much everyone does deduplication and compression or compression, then deduplication, and then they do encryption last. And likewise, when they read the data back, they decrypt it first before they uh, rehydrate the data or uncompress or reinflate the data. Uh, and so, of course, if you are encrypting data locally and you want to do deduplication or backup, you have to decrypt it, send it to the backup, and then the backup system can deduplicate it and then re-encrypt it if needed. Okay, that is the end of my introductory section. Now, we turn it over back to you, Alex, and then to Abhishek. Thank you, John. Um, we've got a question in from the audience, but I think we'll answer that at the back end. Uh, it's a question about compaction, which is a, a, an alternative technique. But I'll, I'll talk about the compaction at the back end of the presentation. In the meanwhile, I'm just going to let Abhishek run riot and take us through uh, the more in-depth data deduplication. Thanks, Abhishek. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, John, for those insights on data deduplication. And let's continue our discussion on some of the concepts and design considerations for deduplication. I'm going to call dedupe for short for deduplication for the rest of the slide. Let's first talk about the granularity of uh, dedupe. So what does file-based dedupe? Now, let's say we have six files that we want to store. And some of these files have exactly the same contents, like, like file F1 and F4 shown here, and files F3 and F6. So when you store these files on a system that does file or object level deduplication, the system is going to store the unique file content only once. So here we see that the contents of file F1 and F4 are stored once, and the contents of file F3 and F6 are stored only once. But is this good enough? And yes, the answer actually is no. So let's go one level deeper inside the contents of these files. If we break up the contents of the files into blocks and identify these blocks uniquely by their content, then we have more information about the file's content to find redundancies beyond the file or the object level. Like for example, here files F1 and F3 have two blocks in common. Those are blocks A, and C, and so on. So when you store these files on a system that does deduplication at the block level, the system will store the unique blocks only once. This system is definitely more space efficient than the one which can only dedupe at the file or the object level. But we're back to the same question again. Can we do better? And yet again, the answer is yes. So let's dig a bit deeper into this block level D2. Looking at how the blocks can be defined, 
we can go for a simple method of having fixed size blocks or fixed size chunks. I'm going to use blocks and chunks interchangeably. So let's look at what happens when a file is actually modified and, you know, and when a file is actually divided into fixed size, size chunks and then it's modified later. So the yellow portion actually shows the difference between the two files, or let's say two versions of the same file. The modified file has some more data written to at the beginning of the file as shown here. And now when we break this file up into fixed size blocks, we see that all the blocks are actually now misaligned. And we're not gonna get any space efficiency with DDO because all the blocks are different. So what is the solution? to this problem. The solution actually is to use what is known as variable size blocks. So take our original file and assume that we can magically, uh, like rather intelligently find block boundaries given a certain minimum and maximum block size. And now consider the same scenario as before with a modified file having some changes. Now consider using the same intelligent block boundary detection on the modified file, we will be able to achieve this. Now, you see here the only block, or say the on, only few initial blocks that have the changes will be different. But the rest of the blocks, they align nicely with the blocks from the original file. So storing these two files on a system that does dedupe with variable size blocks will actually save space by storing these unique blocks only once. Now, how exactly we can find such variable size block boundaries intelligently, we're going to see in the future slide. Let us first understand a typical deduplication storage pipeline. And we're going to look at the right pipeline here because that is where dedupe happens. The reads are similar to any other system where you, know, you, you have to read the whole data back. So the first step is to take the input data and partition it into chunks. This is just the way we saw in the earlier slides, you know, either with fixed size blocks or chunks or variable size blocks. Let's call this step chunking. The second step is to fingerprint these chunks so that they can be identified uniquely by using a small fingerprint like a cryptographic hash. Let's call this step fingerprinting. The third step is to find if any of the blocks or chunks identified are already present in the system and filter them out. Let's call this step filtering. And after this step, we know what the unique data is that needs to be stored, and we can simply go ahead and store it potentially after doing some compression on it. Now, this is a very simple high-level view of the steps involved in the DDoF pipeline. And let's take a closer look at the heart of this dedupe pipeline, basically the three steps of chunking, fingerprinting, and filtering. Now, if you remember, we talked earlier about finding block boundaries intelligently to be able to do uh, the variable size chunking. Let's see how we can do that. So suppose there's an incoming data stream, say the contents of a file. And what we can do is basically to calculate a feature at rolling positions. This is, think of this like a hash, a rolling hash. And then select a point based on some predefined property. You know, let's call this the anchor point. So let's see what, what happens. Now we start calculating the values on the rolling positions. And then we find a value that meets our property, a predefined property we set. So this is our anchor position and this defines our block boundary. And we continue doing the same for the whole of the data stream. And then we get this variable size block boundaries. So a few things to note here. The anchor itself can end or begin a chunk. All this process has to be fast enough because what I essentially described is a ribbon fingerprinting process. So we need to update the fingerprints at a very high speed. And there has to be a certain minimum and maximum chunk size threshold because we want to avoid the pathological conditions. 
Now, this is just a brief overview, and you can find the, the details of Raven fingerprinting on rolling windows and all that in a, in a publicly available paper, and I highly recommend reading that. But the thing to note is that this variable size chunking is, is widely available technology today. Now, moving on to fingerprinting, this step actually can be done by using standard techniques like using cryptographic hashes that have an extremely low probability of collision. And this is where a lot of people ask about what is that small probability? What is that low probability? And should we even worry about it? Let's take an example. Okay, suppose we take a SHA-1 fingerprint, a 160-bit fingerprint, and we take a large data set size. I have taken 530 exabytes here and a relatively small dedupe chunk size of eight kilobytes. So the probability of a collision with that massive data set is that extremely small number that you see, the decimal followed by, I don't know, 10 or 12 zeros and, and that. So if you want to make sense of what this number actually means, think of these two examples. The probability of a RAID 6 failure within five years is that number which is a million or billion times higher than that. And remember, rate six is industry standard, and, and five years is, is the length, the maximum length that your storage will be in, 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 your, in use, say, end of life. So you're gonna have much higher probability of a rate six failure on your device before a T2. And a second example, just out of fun, think of the probability of being struck by lightning. Even that is a billion times higher. So we, what this says is that we really don't, shouldn't be worried about you know, collisions. Filtering, okay, so remember filtering is basically uh, looking up an index to find duplicates. So let's look at some of the challenges and approaches to, to filtering. So let's say we want to build a, a disk-based uh, dedupe system. And uh, suppose we don't try to do anything smart about this, you know. So let's assume that the data ingest throughput required is about 1.2 gigabytes per second. This is actually uh, it's rather low end for an enterprise system. I'm taking it for example. And let's say the storage capacity of the system is in terabytes, hundreds of terabytes range. And that's kind of reasonable again for an enterprise class system. So with such capacity, the constraint is that we cannot hold the index in memory. And then taking example of the eight kilobyte chunk size, we're actually gonna require 150,000 lookups per second to sustain the dedoop. Now, with 7,200 RPM drives, we will need about 1,200 disks to actually sustain the IOPS requirement of index lookup for dedoop. Clearly, you know, we need to be smart here. So what are the things to consider? So I'm giving two examples here. So first, to reduce index lookup, we can try to make use of data locality on storage to help, you know, preset fingerprints in a cache that we can filter against instead of filtering against the disk lookups. And secondly, we can use compact data structures like Bloom filters that can still fit in memory for a large data set. And, and although being probabilistic in nature, they can still provide you some uh, categorical answers like, uh, for example, whether a fingerprint is surely not present in the system. And this can further avoid your index lookup requirements. So let's look further into uh, the first example that I gave, how data locality can be used to reduce the index lookup requirement. To use data locality to, locality to our advantage, we can store the temporally closed chunks that we get from the data stream in packed units that will be loaded together into a cache for lookup. Now let's take an example to illustrate this. Say we have a file, file one, which is the first version of a file and that let's say all data in that file is, is kind of unique. This uh, typically an example would be like the first full backup on a system. And so when we store these blocks, we can actually pack them into these packed units and store them as units on the disk. So we continue this and we're gonna store everything into these packed units. Now let's say we want to 
store the second version, the next version of this file, say the next full backup. So when we get the first chunk, we use this reference to load the packed unit from the disk into the cache. Now remember, uh, we're loading actually the fingerprints, not the whole data. We don't need to load the whole data, but I'm giving the, you this as an, as an example. So when we load these fingerprints in the cache, we start getting hits in the memory cache. And we continue getting these hits. And at some point in time, there will be more packed units to load. And we will get more hits. There will be some unique blocks. Like, for example, I'll show here this unique block, which is not there. So we are not going to get a hit on that. But overall, you'll find that we are able to reduce the index lookup requirements for deduplication. So techniques like these must be used to build practical systems that can dedupe at very high speeds with high data reduction, but using reasonable hardware, like not using 1,200 disks. So having looked at the, the challenges in, in designing a basic deduplication pipeline, now let's look at some other design considerations that we might need to you know, consider. So should we do inline dedupe or post-process dedupe? You may have heard of these terms. So with inline dedupe, the system dedupes the data as it is ingested or stored. So the obvious advantage is that you actually don't need a landing zone or you know, a log to store the raw data. And this directly translates to less storage requirement. You also save resources because you don't have to read the data again to dedo. And uh, another hidden, hidden advantage is that uh, with inline dedo, the data is ready to make an efficient replica or DR copy, data DR copies instantly. So this leads to much better you know, recovery times. And finally, these systems are also relatively easier to size you know, if some very basic data set characteristics are known. On the other hand, if the system does post-processing by doing dedupe later after ingest, it is possible to get more dedupe theoretically because it is not tightly constrained by the ingest requirements. At the same time, since the resource intensive dedo process uh, can, be, can be controlled better, the ingest speeds can remain less affected. And this also fits some of the use cases better. For example, when you know that you need immediate readback of data once it is ingested, so that the readback doesn't have to go through the extra dedo processing, the extra indirections that may be required for dedo. Another thing to consider while designing a DDoF system is global versus local DDoF. And this is, of course, a question with systems that, that have more than one partition or more than one nodes, for example, in, in a, in a scale-out cluster. So with global DDoF, you're essentially creating a single DDoF domain by filtering across multiple storage domains. Remember the typical dedupe pipeline we, we discussed earlier, those, those steps of uh, uh, chunking, fingerprinting, and filtering? The filtering phase here needs to be able to filter across all the partitions or nodes to store data uniquely. And the advantage is, is assumed to be actually straightforward that we should get more storage efficiency. And the cons are the increased complexity, for example, to maintain it distributed index to filter across multiple nodes. And, and this also leads to the possibility of performance issues, bottlenecks, or higher latencies, because you now have to coordinate across multiple nodes. And we all know how complicated that can get. So you know, a, a note of caution is actually worth mentioning here, as, as we tend to dismiss this global versus local trade-off very casually. What happens is that you know, to achieve the performance from a global DDo cluster, you know, oftentimes there are many optimizations that have to be done to reduce cross-node interaction, and they actually might lead to, you know, lesser storage efficiencies than a, a well-optimized single node, uh, you know, which has a local DDoP domain. Uh, 
So it is important to understand, you know, not only the, the product, but also your requirements, you know, your data size, the growth, and, you know, and then choose a system that works best for you. Okay, what about Flash? You know, they're, they're, so, they're so cheap now. So there are two ways in which uh, Flash is, is primarily used in data deduplication, either as a cache with a disk-based storage or as the storage itself natively. So when using as a cache, there are uh, multiple consumption patterns that we see. You know, some use it as a log. Typically, when doing post-processing, they store the raw data on, on the fly. And a lot of storage vendors actually use it to accelerate their random lookup requirements. An example for that is to, for example, store the entire index onto Flash. And you can use it to store other file system metadata as well. You know, pretty much anything you will need to reference in the data path to get the data. And that requires you to have fast random lookups. And going further, it could also be used in, in workloads which are dominated by overwrites to absorb the churn before doing dedupe. And for reads, you could actually use it to prefetch some important data, data that needs you know, uh, faster restores. So the, the overall observation here is that you know, Flash as a cache is, is predominantly used in more capacity optimized storage, like for example, for protection or backup storage marking. Now, the, the other way to consume the Flash is to use it as the actual storage, not as a cache. And DDoP is well suited for Flash as it helps to reduce the, the cost of data reduction. It, it also helps to reduce uh, uh, the wear and tear by eliminating the redundant writes. Now, uh, another thing to point out here is that the total cost of ownership is, is actually a factor that makes use of uh, that, that you know that makes the use of flash as dedupe uh, storage more suited to performance optimized storage for for example primary storage use cases but uh, remember these are only current trends and over the next few years uh, things will probably change and I, I think they will change so let's look at you know the dedupe in in action by looking at the backup storage use case in a bit more detail to see how dedupe can help us in practical systems. So how do backups happen on a dedupe-based storage system? So from the outside, a dedupe system would look like, look or feel like any other normal storage system where you can store and retrieve data. But what happens when you ingest the first full backup? So assuming that we're doing a block-level dedupe, the redundant blocks in the backup are identified, and only the unique blocks are stored once. Now, what happens when we take the first incremental? Some blocks are already present in the system, and the new ones are written down. Same thing happens with the further incrementals. And where we see massive savings is for example, when you take the next full backup. So instead of storing this huge backup, we only have to store those few new unique blocks in this full backup. Now, what does it mean in terms of real savings? Here's an example. So let's say the first full on a Friday uh, takes around or gives you around two to four X reduction only. Now I'm assuming here the limited dedupe within the backup and also assuming a little bit of compression that is used. So saying uh, that the backup size is one terabyte, logical size, it would take about 250 gigabytes of storage space. And then let's assume the incrementals are roughly 10% of the full backup size and they get reasonable dedupe with the original full. Here, the 10% number is actually very aggressive. Uh, typically, what we, have, what we see in the field is, uh, you know, usually the, the backup use cases, you see 3%, 5% in, in, you know, in those ranges. But this, this is an example, and we are, we're just taking a huge turn there as an example. So you're going to see about 7 to 10x reduction in the incrementals. 
And finally, the full, the next full that you take is going to get you very high DDO. And for the week, it would translate to roughly, you know, seven to eight times reduction. It's an impressive saving. And if you take this example for longer retention, you could actually see the space savings that you can achieve with DDO. And with just eight to 10 weeks of, you know, backups, you can get up to 20x. And, and, this, and I can tell you firsthand, actually, that these uh, data reduction ratios are not unreal. You know, this is what some available products, actually most available products, can give you straight out of the box with at least the backup uh, uh, data sets. Now, let's take a look at some more advanced considerations that, that you may actually come across for, for data duplication. You may have heard of people uh, talking about client-side dedupe, source-side dedupe, or that being superior. And let's see how that compares with, with target-side dedupe and what do you need to consider. So target-side dedupe is simple. You know, you just let the storage system do the magic. And it's pretty much like drop in the environment like solution. And that's what we kind of looked at in the, in, in the previous slides. So the advantage is simplicity. With source side data, you actually reduce the data at the source or, or the client itself. And this is what John was referring to in his, in his uh, uh, slides as well. So what, what is good about this is that you don't need to send the redundant data over the network. But you know, you'll most likely require uh, an agent or some kind of application awareness to be built in, in your application server. And just to provide you with a realistic uh, example of this in, in the backup or uh, protection storage solution, there are clients, you know, like, you know, for example, if I take databases and virtual machines or file systems, they, there are agents or proxies that can actually identify the data at the source and can back up only the differential data, the data that has changed. So source size dedupe actually helps a lot with offloading the work from the target and thereby scaling the overall infrastructure. But sometimes it doesn't make sense, for example, with, with workloads that have high change rates. And in practice, actually what we see is that most often a combination of both of these you know, the source side and the target side work best. And I have a couple of examples of, of what this means and how the, this combination is used today. So the first technique is actually what is known as synthesized backups. The idea is very simple. You send the changed data to the deduplication storage and then ask it to stitch up a full backup image with the extents that are already present from the previous backup. Now let's see how. So suppose we have a full backup with the following file, F1 to F7. Now let's say the next day, two of the files have changed. You here referred to as F3 dash and F5 dash and a new file was also added. Now, what the client does is to just send the changed files to the target device and then ask the backup storage device to synthesize the full image of this current backup from the previous one by incorporating those changes. Now, what this does is it eliminates the need for what is known as incremental or differential restores. That means you always have the latest full copy to restore if needed. That makes your recovery, your disaster recovery much faster because you always have a full, full copy. Now, what you needed for this was not only the intelligence on the client or the source side, but you needed support from the target side as well. Support being able to synthesize the region of data from the previous backup image. And of course, it should be able to do this by using uh, chunk references instead of actually copying the data. That would be lame. And an example that I gave uh, here for a file system backup is a typical use case for using such 
synthesis operations. Another similar technique that is useful for backing up entire disks or database images is by tracking changed blocks from the clients themselves. In this case, you know, often there is a certain fixed block size on the source or on the client side, and the changes happen on these blocks as the database or the virtual machine runs the production workload. Now, to take a new backup in this case, the client simply requests the DLOOP storage to make an instant clone from the previous backup. Now, this is also a help that the target is providing you. It should be able to, able to provide you a fast clone. And there are many storage uh, uh, solutions today that provide you with this capability. Uh, typically with you know, DDoop, you can make a, you know, an oven copy, a very fast clone copy of the backup. And so what the client does is request the clone and then simply overwrites whatever blocks have changed. And see, this is also a very good example where you depending on your data, data what is what, what is being stored, the data set, you may end up using fixed size blocks. Because we talked about variable size blocks being superior, but sometimes, you know, it simply doesn't make sense to use a big hammer. You know, you know that if your data set is in terms of blocks, fixed size blocks on the client side, if you know that and if you could find that and match that, using a simple fixed size blocks can help you with reducing your resource requirements as well. Lastly, the replication also helps a lot with things like replication, making copies cheaper and, and faster, and then that helps you with your you know, disaster recovery windows and stuff. So the source and the target can simply talk in, term, in terms of chunks. So let's say the source here has, has three chunks, and one of which is already present on the target. The source simply sends the chunk fingerprints to the target, and the target identifies what it already has, and then tells the source what is missing. After this, the source can simply send the chunks that are missing on the target side. Now, this not only helps to reduce the network traffic, but it also makes copies up to date faster. And this is a big win when you have to make a second copy that is instantly available and help with your disaster recovery SLAs. Let's say you were you were doing your backups on 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 your on your primary site and if God forbid there was a disaster, you now have a very up to date copy on your replica, which because of the duplication you were able to make a copy much faster. So your, your SLAs are much better when using this, this kind of, uh, you know, dedupe. So to, to conclude this section, we've looked at not only how to do data deduplication and, you know, what to consider for the design trade-offs, but also uh, an example of how dedupe technology helps to solve real problems like that of uh, data protection or backups. And, and I can tell you actually that you know every single uh, Fortune 500 company definitely you know protects the data and likely uses some kind of DDoP technology behind that. So this technology is pervasive. So you know with that, I'd like to hand it back to to Alex to sum this up for us. Thank you. I've actually got a question for you that came in while you were speaking. Mm -hmm. What is the impact? We talked about variable block and fixed block. Uh, type of activities when, when deduplicating and having a, a sliding window. What is the overhead of doing variable versus fixed block on particularly primary storage when you're doing it in line? Is, is, is it noticeable? Does it buy any problems for you if you do it that way? Yeah, very good question. Actually, this is it is a trade-off. Your variable size uh, blocks would actually be more resource intensive. You actually, the process that we looked at with uh, the ribbon fingerprinting, uh, it, it is actually calculating hashes, rolling hashes continuously, trying to find that boundary, match your you know, predefined uh, property. For example, let's say you want the last few 
uh, uh, pitch to be zero. That's your criteria. So you got to cal keep calculating rolling hashes until you match that value, and that's where your boundary is. So that whole process is taking bandwidth, is taking CPU, you mm -hmm. know, resources from your system. If you do fixed size, you know what the boundary is. You don't have to do all of that. You just decide that this is your fixed boundary, and that's simple. So it, you know, in a way, it is helping you do things faster and on. On the other side, I also mentioned on, on the last slide about the, the cloned backups. Your fixed size actually might save you more storage space in that, in that case because you're not relying on the variable sized block boundaries to do the right thing for you. You already know what the right thing is. Your client has a fixed block size. If you could match that, that's the most perfect solution. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good point. Um, Somebody also mentioned, just let me find this here. Somebody mentioned uh, why not add compaction, where compaction is about putting small um, files into data blocks and saving having to write you know, large data blocks with very small files. We can actually push them inside the block itself in terms of the metadata. I'll cover that in a second because we've actually got a presentation that covered the overview techniques that might be used here. And I'll, I'll mention it when we get on to it. So, without further ado, let me summarize. This is my really bad joke at the bad end, back end. Uh, you know, New York, so good they named it twice, New York, New York. Uh, in fact, as we now can see, um, they only named it once and left two pointers in place. Uh, sorry, I really apologize for that. I, I, I give it some thought last night about what I should say here. And <laughs> that was the worst I could come up with. Anyway. Deduplication is so common, it's actually hard to find storage systems without it as a feature. As Abhishek said earlier, that you know that it, this, this is just something that everyone now does. And as John indicated, you can do it in multiple places as well. You know, you can not only deduplicate across a, uh, in a system, but across systems, you can deduplicate in the device itself. There's a whole bunch of places we can do with this, uh, do this deduplication. The nice thing about these techniques is that they work with any kind of uh, data that we might wish to throw at them. You know, this works for files, it works with block storage, it works with object storage. In fact, it works anything with, with, with anything that has some degree of repetitive bit pattern somewhere within it. So deduplication is a, is a big win, and it significantly reduces cost by many factors. In fact, you should really think of it as space amplification. So you're going out there and buying terabytes worth of data then something like deduplication, combined with other techniques that we've talked about, things like compression, can get you huge amounts of space amplification. The other thing I think that's, that's quite important to recognize as well is there are some performance issues with deduplication, but in the main, it is such a good thing to do that, in fact, it's, it's, it's really not something I think that should be of too much concern to people. Deduplicating works. We know it works, and we have a whole set of uh, benchmarks where we can show systems providing very, very high performance, even while deduplicating and compressing. So the data reduction overview piece that I was talking about was that webcast there. There's a, an overall data reduction piece where we talk about deduplication, compaction, compression. There's also a compression uh, presentation if you want to know more about how we go about compressing data. And this one we've done is deduplication. So we've got a series now of presentations that cover from a fairly high level, an overview level with that first link, all the way up to um, uh, compression and deduplication. So after this webcast, what would I like you to do? Well, as you leave, I'd like you to give us some feedback. We really appreciate feedback. We really like to see what you think of the presentations, any recommendations you have for us. Don't forget that we will also take the questions that were asked today, and we will answer them on our blog. You'll see the address there. And you can also follow us specifically, the NSF, that's the Networking Storage Forum, not just SNEA, but you get SNEA from at SNEA, but you can also get us on at SNEA NSF. And without further ado, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for being here today. I'd like to thank Abhishek and John.
for providing us with a really interesting overview on deduplication and some in-depth talk about how these technologies are used in modern storage systems. With that, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, good whatever's left of your day. Enjoy it. Thank you.